Hello friends, my name is Eric from Rapid Flow. I'm making a follow-up video to one of the most watched videos on my channel, which is about the gear that I've cherry-picked over 25 years of making music. Well, there's been some upgrades and changes to the studio, so let me take you through some of them. Ah, and if you want to support the channel, there are affiliate links in the description. Please consider liking and subscribing. Let's jump in. I think what I would like to start with, and probably the biggest upgrade, is uh, having actually replaced the Mackie mixer that I'd been working with, with an uh, APB uh, ProRack H1020. Uh, huge thanks uh, to Matthias and uh, the wonderful people at uh, the German distributor uh, of APB. Uh, they were super cool to, to sort me out and do collaborations. So I'm going to be doing a, a video on this in detail uh, at a certain point in the future, uh, but I want to be really in-depth into using it before I, uh, I start sharing more about it. But what I can say is that it's an incredible sounding mixer. Um, yeah, it's a huge step up from the Mackie 1604 that I was using. I mean, that's a proven, that's a great mixer, but this just, yeah, when you hear it, especially because I make sample packs, everything feels clear, a bit more elegant, a bit more transparent, a bit more punchy. The EQs are great. The routing is very good. Uh, I like the way it's very easy to see what's muted and what's not. Um, yeah, overall, really, really great mixer that I'm very happy to have in the studio. It's a proven animal that a lot of people actually use. I think the next big upgrade that's happened, Orpheus converters. Yeah, as you know, I make sample packs uh, and, and things like that for rapid flow. So I wanted to have a way to improve the quality of synths going in. And um, I realized that these were being sold pretty cost effectively compared to what they used to cost because Firewire is no longer supported under OS X, which means that uh, the only way you can run these now is via ADAT, which is exactly what I'm doing. I'm running ADAT in out. Uh, into the Quantum, and that is still my uh, main interface going via uh, Thunderbolt to the Mac. Uh, everything's being clocked of one of the Orpheuses because they're known to have really great clocks. So this is clocking uh, this guy as well as the Quantum, but the Quantum is the bridge to the computer. And because it has two ADATs, I'm actually able to run both of these off of just one converter. But for tracking and for recording synths, they bring a lot of vibe uh, and just like they make it a little bit more maybe harmonious, maybe a little bit more magical than it comes straight off the machine. But in getting them and checking the differences with the quantum converters, they are really, really good converters. Like they are not far off. I would say they're maybe, there's like a five to 10% perceptible difference between them. So, you know, is it worth it? In my case, if you're making sample packs for other people, I think it is worth it. But if I would just be using this stuff for the studio only, maybe I would get one or, or maybe I would actually just stick with the Quantum. So big, big kudos again to Personas for the Quantum's lowest latency interfaces on the market. I think uh, an amazing sounding for the price. So yeah, for bang for the buck, pretty much unbeatable. Um, yeah, I extended the patch bay. Uh, that was the only way to get everything hooked in. So I'm actually now running three patch bays. There's no more room in the rack, so that's good. So I won't be able to add more converters or patch bays. And the reason why I had to get the patch bays is because my outboard uh, has changed. Uh, as you may know, if you've watched this channel before, I already had uh, the Kush Tweakers, which are amazing, super versatile Swiss Army knife compressors. They, yeah, they can do anything. They have amazing distortion on them. Uh, you can set them so that they emulate other compressors. I really like them, um, but I wanted to have some different flavors. So the first thing that I got from Wes Audio was the Rea. Uh, and at this point, actually, I'd like to make a little quick excursion um, and say a big thank you to Michal, who is the owner at Rea and his technical team, because I had some issues with one of mine and they were super cool and replaced it up front with another one uh, that's actually been specially tuned by them to uh, give me a certain uh, characteristic that I was looking for. So thank you, Michal, and your team and everyone at West Audio. Uh, yeah, rare to find a company that takes care of its customers that well. So going back uh, to the um, compressor uh, called Rea. It's a Varimoo, very modern take on a Varimoo compressor. It has tubes in it running at high voltage. It's digitally controlled, so you can, that's why there's little USB cables going in here. You can run it as a plugin from your session. You can run it uh, fully analog. 
very yeah cool modern technology the stuff that Wes is doing is incredible I really recommend you to check it out uh, and as a very Moog compressor I think actually reasonably affordable compared to what you know the the, the normal very Moog compressors that are out there will set you back with full digital recall it sounds amazing on the master uh, it just adds a whole bunch of mojo through the compression characteristics and then the total harmonic distortion circuit that you can bring in on medium is incredible I'll do a more in-depth video on this. From Wes I'm also running the Prometheus which is like a Pultec without tubes. Now that may sound ridiculous but actually it's a great EQ for sculpting low end with uh, kick drum spaces because it doesn't have the wooliness of the tubes it's it but it has the vibe of a Pultec, uh, the shelving filters and um, boost and cuts. So really really cool you can run it in dual mono you can run it in stereo. I use it for sculpting the low end uh, and uh, the um, kick and bass uh, to the low end of the mix down or the kick and bass independently. Next to it is something new from Kush again, uh, the Clarifonic EQs. I've been using these as a plugin for a long time. It's kind of a secret tool of mine that I use actually on my mix downs and on my live sets to get things to be more present and upfront. And because I love the way it sounds so much, I got it in hardware also. I haven't used it so much, it only arrived recently, so I have to get into this a bit more. What stayed is uh, my tracking front end, which is um, sort of a line drivers of API, Neve and SSL and then uh, uh, the filtering bank and e tilting EQ from um, Louder Than Liftoff, Chop Shop. Hugely recommended. I'll do videos actually on all of these pieces as we go along and I will link them somewhere here in this video. So if you see a link, that means there's a video for it that you can check out. This is a really cool piece to track through because you can narrow the band that you give any instrument as you record it in. Uh, so yeah, this is, a, this is never gonna leave my studio. These things are amazing uh, also in mastering uh, settings. New is this uh, Studer Stereo EQ. It's like a very musical EQ that just adds a lot of yeah, mojo and vibe. It's not very surgical, but when you st send stuff through it, especially the mix down the master, it just sounds somehow a bit more finished, even with just one or two dB gain dialed in. Really nice piece um, that I use pretty often now on mix downs. Uh, and I've actually sampled synths through there also. Yeah, and then these guys, um, Golden Age Project, uh, which are basically um, clones in a sense of LA-2As. I've always loved LA-2As. I have used the UAD version extensively. This is as close as you can get to an affordable clone that has uh, all the uh, circuits in it um, uh, in a pretty small form factor. I recently ran some vocals through it for a track that I'm producing with an amazing uh, young singer from France slash Argentina, uh, Camille. <laughs> I hope you're doing well. Yeah, and it just immediately sounded like a record. Um, really underestimated pieces uh, that I can absolutely recommend. And that's been a, a really nice addition. As you see, I've uh, sold uh, the Behringer slash Clark Technic uh, EQs that's been replaced by this Pultec. They sounded incredible also, but this just gave me a bit more of a cleaner feel. And uh, yeah, I think the next thing I would like to take you to is uh, this tape recorder here. Uh, again, being in the land of Revox and Studer, uh, which come from Switzerland, there was the possibility to grab uh, this tape recorder for a pretty reasonable price. And someone's actually, I, I met this mad genius in the village next over from me who's modded this and built this custom remote control. Like you could never buy this from the factory. Um, so yeah, you can uh, basically control remote tape machine uh, while you're comfortably sitting in front of your screen um, doing stuff. So let me show this to you because it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty brilliant. So very, very cool. The machine has been fully recapped by him. It sounds uh, amazing. It's super stable. Um, and actually the latest instrument that I'm going to be releasing probably in about a week or two, I'm working on the final details, is a sample of a new synth that I got. It's a clone from Behringer of the Roland System 100. It went through the tape. Uh, so I made two variations one through the tape, one through a Neve DI that I'm going to show you in a sec and it sounds amazing. So I'll link to that also in this video and if you like really short punchy upfront bass for like 16th basses in melodic techno definitely check out our System 100 bass. It's uh, yeah it came out incredible through the tape machine and the mixer. Um, yeah and speaking of um, 
I have a collaboration also ongoing uh, with Rupert Neve Designs and they were super cool. I've been using the, the master bus processor for a while. This is actually also a new addition. I've been sampling things through it and uh, running my mix down through it. It sounds amazing. Just a little bit of it just adds a little bit of magic professional sound you could say like it just makes things feel like a record um, so I just put that mostly on the master bus or I sometimes track synths through it and the other thing that I got from them is this um, stereo DI box let me see if I can get it to focus on there um, yeah and what that does uh, so basically the main left right output of my mixer is going to that stereo DI box and then to an, into a mic pre of the prism. And this gives me a pretty colored sort of transformer vibe kind of sound. And if I want to have a sound more clean, I'll send it out through groups three, four, and they go to my patch bay. And from there I can send them either to a prism converter or a quantum converter. So I have options for that. But most of the stuff in the studio these days gets tracked through the Rupert Neve DI box. I'm going to make a video on this absolutely because it's a really cool way to get a transformer kind of yeah expensive sound into your studio without breaking the bank. It's not super, super expensive for a piece of Neve equipment. Um, so yeah, look out for that. It's, uh, it's going to be an interesting video, I think. Right above it, um, uh, another upgrade that I did thanks to my friends at Digital Audio Service uh, who I'm collaborating with also and who made me a really cool offer on this is the Amphion 115 monitors. Uh, also a video is in progress on that. Since I, 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 you may remember I was using the DMAX uh, speakers, let me zoom out here a little bit, uh, the DMAX monitors and they were really, really good for the money. I kind of regret selling them uh, for like a compact speaker kind of up close. They were really easy and pleasant to work with. But since I am making all these sample packs and of course for my own music, I wanted to really get the best monitoring that I could afford and I landed on the Amphion ones. Now I will make an in-depth video on them, but to be really frank, the first month with them was hell because they are really hard and really unusual for my ears because I've been using silk tone tweeters for about 15 years because I once had a tinnitus and I, I, I um, felt like silk tone tweeters were softer but I heard so many good things about these that I wanted to try them and digital audio service in Hamburg were super cool and said hey give them a shot and if you don't like them you can send them back so I was like okay yeah and the first month was tough because I was so unused to it and they're so revealing and so upfront and transparent and punchy that I was like I was doubting if I'd made the right decision until I started listening to the mixes I did on them and the tweaks I did on them on instruments and they are one of the most revealing monitors I have ever used they help you making the right mix decisions they're incredible to work on I think right now 95% of the time spent in the studio for me is spent on them and a little bit on VSX and like the big speakers here I just switch them on when I want to have some fun tracking but rarely uh, because I've gotten quite used to the Amphions and my ears actually don't respond to them so strongly anymore took a bit of break in on my side um, but they're an incredible monitor um, that does not need a sub in a small room in my opinion and is super transparent and punchy and shows you exactly all the errors that may still be present in your track so that was a big big upgrade combined actually with some Vovox cabling from the um, Dangerous Source which is still here you'll remember this from the first video I swapped out some standard cables that I had with some Vovox cables going to the amp and that actually brought a big difference you'll see more of that in the Amphion video linked above. Uh, controllers have stayed the same. Um, this is an interesting piece that has recently made it into my studio which is the Oxy One. I'm also doing a collaboration with them. Uh, thank you very much for sending me this at a, at a special price. It's a really really deep deep instrument or, or a sequencer. I'm just starting to scratch the surface but I've already started to find stuff that I think is incredible. For example you can set the latency offset for every MIDI channel independently in case your one of your synths or some effect or something is not responding tightly to the sequence so you can shift forward just that track or the whole machine that's awesome I don't own any other sequencers that have that function so easily available um, yeah so super interesting this is definitely going to come traveling with me and uh, wonderful build quality really intuitive to use super powerful functions with like chord construction and stuff if you're looking for an all 
can do it all type of sequencer, I think this would be my recommendation. But I, I, I need to do an in-depth video on it still. So um, yeah, speaking of sequencers, uh, my trusty BeatStep Pro is also still here. I don't think this will ever leave. It's such a useful uh, synth uh, sequencer. Uh, so fast to work with once you get used to it. Um, yeah, I love working with it. This is hardwired to uh, the Telemark, to the DRM1 uh, in my rack up here. I have a, a Telemark, which is basically a SEM clone and the drum machine above it. And the final uh, MIDI CV of it is going to this ARP uh, 2600 clone from Behringer. And with it, I'm able to create sequences and drums really, really quickly. Uh, but yeah, it has some downsides. It's it's monophonic, so you can't do chords with it or anything like that. Um, yeah, and speaking of uh, clones, this has been a new addition to the studio. And actually, this was kind of influenced by a comment I read from um, Hannes Bieger. Um, he mentioned that he felt the Roland System 100 bass is the driest, punchiest bass that you can really use in some situations. And um, I didn't want to splash out for the original modules because they're really expensive. And then I found that Behringer does these clones of them and they were pretty affordable, especially used. Uh, so I built myself a little system and it's not like a proper modular in the way that it has sequencers and you kind of make you know your tracks just in that box. I just use it like a kind of a very clear bass voice um, with uh, yeah like a very very punchy upfront uh, sound. So if you like like if you're looking for a way to make analog sounding 16th bass like you hear it a lot in um, afterlife recordings. That's the machine, that's the sound, and I've sampled it through all the gear you've, I've just described and the tape machine. So there's two versions in the sample pack we're releasing soon. One has gone through the Neve, one has gone through the tape machine. There's a version with filter open, filter closed. <laughs> Sounds amazing. You should definitely check it out when it comes out if you're looking for a bass like that. Um, my trusty multi-clock is still here performing its duties. I recently found out actually that the ERM company uh, soon will no longer exist, uh, but there's a follow-up company by some of the founders which are going to be producing exactly the same device under a new name. I forget the name, but I will put it in the link uh, in the chat, uh, sorry, in the description. Um, if you're looking for a way to sync a complex studio, this is a must-have, uh, I still think to this day. It's just, yeah, it's so great to be able to shift things in time. I had a student recently come visit me actually here for classes and I was showing him all these workflows and the one thing that he definitely said he also wanted one of is the multi-clock. Um, so super, super recommended uh, piece of gear also for yeah complex setups with multiple MIDI clocks running to multiple devices. Um, finally, I think one new piece also that I'm super happy I got is the Prophet 6. I actually had to listen uh, to various Prophet iterations. I realized even though I would have thought I liked the Prophet 5 most from the vibe of it, I felt the Prophet 6 was more deep and just offered more interesting tones and, and kind of stereo tools as well as having the effects built in and everything. So, and I actually kind of felt like I liked the vibe of it more. And so far when I've used it in tracks, I've realized it just beds in so nicely and it's so fast to work with. There's no menus really besides double functions on the front here. I love working with it. Uh, that's also a synth that is going to come traveling with me. So that's the most important, I think, new additions. Uh, there has been a Rhythm uh, MK2 that's come into the studio that I'm uh, mostly sampling for drums and actually the bass on it is incredible. I'm preparing uh, an instrument with its bass, but that's gonna take me a few weeks still. And everything else has pretty much stayed the same in the instrument rack here. And there's been one significant addition here, thanks to the wonderful uh, people at Waldorf who sent me the uh, uh, Iridium keyboard. Uh, I've actually done a bunch of videos on it recently, which I will link uh, in uh, in here. There's one on sound design, there's like a live jam, and then there is a video explaining why I think this is an incredible synth for electronic music. Um, yeah, check out those videos if you want to know more, but it sounds amazing. It's so easy to program. It basically covers any kind of synthesis known to man, pretty much. And uh, yeah, it's a super, super deep synth that's actually fast to use. So check out those videos uh, if that's of interest to you. 
a really really nice machine and actually one of the nicest key beds I've ever played so really a pleasure uh, to to enter my music through this uh, key bed just for that actually it's almost yeah it's indispensable already in the studio um, yeah and then I think the the, the big final uh, change which some of you may have seen on screen already uh, is I've switched uh, to Bitwig. Uh, I'd like to say hello to uh, Placidos and his crew over at Bitwig, who I know from my past. Actually, I, I, I'm definitely not an early adopter, you could say. I've, I, honestly, I've just been so busy with so many things, family, work, uh, making music, that actually switching to a new DAW was just daunting because I knew how long it would take me to get to the same place where I had been with Ableton. But actually, the learning curve, if you know Ableton, is super short. Um, and I think, or let's say my, my impression, my reasons for switching, A, the look, it just feels so much fresher, so much more pleasing on the eyes. Um, initially, I had to get used to it a bit because it feels a bit colorful and bright, but now that I've started using it, actually, it just feels really nice. What people generally say about it feeling somehow more creative uh, and supporting creativity, I can totally understand. I'm starting to understand it now, like it just, it doesn't, f I don't know, like I could compare it maybe in a weird way to like Ableton feels more in that sense very grey and 2D and kind of, yeah, very functional and this, there's been a lot of thought into the way the colors are used, actually a lot of them often relate to modulators, but I think the main thing that tipped me over the edge was the fact that I feel like Bitwig has a definite advantage in the low end and the punch and since I've run many projects on both well actually on four doors because of rapid flow I have direct comparison and Bitwig sounded in my opinion much punchier and more present in the low end than um, any other door actually that I have available to me which is Evil Studio Logic and uh, Ableton Live but actually let me show you let me switch off my speakers quickly uh, and let me show you what this sounds like and why I was like whoa okay I like that Yeah, uh, as soon as I heard it, I felt like, whoa, why does this track that all of a sudden uh, feels like it just sounds so much better? I'm, I'm super happy with it. So that's, I think, been one of the biggest changes in the studio. Although actually being able to open my live set, which is what you're seeing on screen right now, just from Ableton without much hassle has been really incredible. So it, it's actually not such a painful switch if you're interested in it also. Um, yeah. That's it. Uh, I've covered everything new, everything fresh, uh, the changes and, and why I felt inclined to make them. Um, yeah, a lot of it was driven because actually Rapid Flow has grown quite a bit, I'm providing instruments and workflows for you. The feedback has been incredible, so I'm super, super happy for that. If you come into this video by chance and you don't know what Rapid Flow is, check out our store linked in the description. It's rapidflow.shop. We offer tools for music producers to become much faster and more productive in the studio and actually have a more fun time doing it. So yeah, check it out. Uh, a lot of tools there, templates, uh, premix samples, all kinds of things so that's it for me today uh, I hope this video has been fun and uh, yeah that you see um, some of the changes that have happened here and uh, maybe some of them uh, could be relevant for you also ah and if any of this gear catches your eye and you want to support the channel there are affiliate links to Tolman in the description so please follow our channel and subscribe uh, if you like what you've seen and uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next one all right take it easy bye bye